scientists define the nature of reality? Poets, writers, dramaturgs, playwrights, not only define reality, but suggest what it should or should not be. Brex, Bertolt Brecht's treatment of Galileo with his strong Marxian underpinnings is a major contribution of the arts to this sort of reality orientation. Stephen Marsh, in turn, in his work with theater, continues this tradition of scientific definitions and what we do with them. Theater is about doing something. Stephen has served as the graduate director of our theater department and the guiding light of many of its productions. They include his leading roles in the Asylum Theater and the Center for Communicating Science, um, all this uh, group. And today, he's going to lead, he produces, directs, and stars in uh, Bertolt Brecht's, Bertolt Brecht's uh, Galileo, Life of Galileo. Now, let me give you a quick rundown on the cast and the people behind the production, aside from Steve. They include the dramaturgs Deborah Gross, Jung Yong Han, Christian Ledbetter, Wei Zheng Wang, and uh, in the cast, Alexander Steiner, Amanda Jane, David Bondir, Deborah Gross, Christine Ledbetter, Jordan Miller, and Galileo Stephen March. So without further ado, Kurt. Bertolt Brecht and Charles Lawton shows one scientist's struggle with morality. Questions of morality are placed squarely on the shoulders of scientists, and their present day ability to communicate ideas that are backed up by science to a nine sons community was started by Galileo. The astronomer, the physicist, the hero, the coward, the human being. As you'll discover in our reading, he may not have invented the telescope, but brought us closer to the stars, or he brought heaven closer to Earth, by understanding how to use it. Galileo's example may be useful to scientists today, allowing them to be courageous enough to break a glass ceiling or to puncture a crystal globe. Please enjoy our reading from scenes from the life of Galileo. Scene one. In the year 1609, science's light began to shine. In Padua City in a modest house. Galileo Galilei set out to prove the sun is still, and the earth is on the move. Galileo's scantily furnished study. Morning. A barefooted boy, Andrea, son of his housekeeper, Mrs. Sardi, enters with a big astronomical model. Where did you get that thing? The coachman brought it. Who sent it? It said from, from the court of Naples on the box. Uh, I don't want this stupid presence. Illuminated manuscripts, a statue of... Hercules, the size of an elephant. They never send money. But isn't this an astronomical instrument, Mr. Galloway? <laughs> that is an antique, too. An expensive toy. What's it for? Well, it's a map of the sky, according to the wise men of ancient Greece. Ah! We'll try to sell it to the university. They still teach it there. How does it work, Mr. Galloway? 
It's complicated. I think I could understand it. Maybe. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Description. There are metal rings, a lot of them. How many? Eight. Correct. And? There are words painted on the bands. What words? The names of stars. Such as? Here is a band with the sun on it, and on the inside of the band is the moon. Now, those metal bands represent crystal globes, eight of them. Crystal? Like huge soap bubbles, one inside the other, and the stars are supposed to be tacked on to them. Spin the band with the sun on it. You see that fixed ball in the middle? Yes. That's the Earth. For 2,000 years, man has chosen to believe that the sun and all the host of stars revolve about him. Well, the Pope, the Cardinals, the Princes, the Scholars, Captains, Merchants, Housewives have pictured themselves squatting in the middle of an affair like that. Locked up inside? Ah! It's like a cage. You sense that? I like to think that the ships began it. Why? Well, they used to hug the coasts, and then all of a sudden they left the coasts and spread out over the oceans. A new age was coming. I was onto it years ago. I was a young man in Siena. There was a group of masons arguing. They had to raise a block of granite, and it was hot. To help matters, one of them wanted to try a new arrangement of ropes. And after five minutes' discussion, out went a method which had been employed for thousands of years. The millennium of faith is dead, said I. This is the millennium of doubt. And we are pulling out of that contraption. The sayings of wise men won't wash anymore. Everybody is at last getting nosy. I predict that in our time, astronomy will become the gossip of the marketplaces and that the sons of fishwives will fill the school. You're off again, Mr. Galloway. By that time, with any luck, they will be learning that the earth rolls around the sun and that their mothers, the captains, the scholars, the princes, and the pope will be rolling with it. That turning around business is no good. I can see with my own eyes that the sun comes up one place in the morning and goes down in a different place in the evening. It doesn't stand still. I can see it move. You don't see anything. All you do is gawk. And gawking is not seeing. Now, okay, that's the sun. Sit down. Where is the sun? On your right or on your left? Left. Now where is it? On the right. And how did it get there? Well, I moved. Of course. Uh, wrong, stupid. The chair moved. But I was on it. Well, of course. The chair is the earth. And you are sitting up. <coughs> Mrs. Sardi, who has come in with a glass of milk and a roll, has been watching. What are you doing with my son, Mr. Galloway? Now, Mother, you don't understand. You understand, don't you? Last night, he tried to tell me that the earth goes round the sun. You'll soon have him saying that two times two is five. Well, apparently we are on the threshold of a new era, Mrs. Sardi. The common misconception about Galileo is that he invented the telescope. However... The first known practical telescopes were invented in the Netherlands at the beginning of the 17th century using glass lenses. Galileo heard about the Dutch telescope in June 1609, built his own within a month, and greatly improved upon the design in the following year. Though he may not have invented it, he did point it in the right direction. Scene 2. January 10, 1610. Galileo Galilei abolishes heaven. Galileo's study at Padua. It is night. Galileo and Segreto at a telescope. The edge of the crescent is jagged. All along the dark part near the shiny crescent, bright particles of light keep coming up, one after the other, and growing larger and merging with the bright crescent. And how do you explain those spots of light? It can't be true. It is true. They are high mountains. On a star. Yes, the shining particles 
are mountain peaks, catching the first rays of the rising sun, while the slopes of the mountains are still dark. And what you see is the sunlight moving down from the peaks into the valley. Does this means all the astronomy that's been told for the last 2,000 years of lie? Yes. What you are seeing now has been seen by no other man besides myself. But the Earth, the moon can't be an Earth with mountains and valleys like our own any more than the Earth can be a star. The moon is an Earth with mountains and valleys, and the Earth is a star. As the moon appears to us, so we appear to the moon. From the moon, the Earth looks something like a crescent, sometimes like half a globe, sometimes a full globe, and sometimes it's not visible at all. Galileo, this is frightening. I've discovered something else, something even more astonishing. There it is, your miraculous optical tube. Do you know that this invention he so picturesquely termed the fruit of 17 years research will be on sale for two scudi apiece at every street corner in Venice? A shipload of them has just arrived from Holland. Oh dear. When I think of the poor gentlemen who believe they were getting an invention they could monopolize for their own profit, why, when they first took their look, first look through the glass, it was only by the merest chance that they didn't see a peddler, seven times enlarged, selling tubes exactly like it at the corner of the street. Mr. Priuli, with the help of this instrument, Mr. Galilei has made discoveries that will revolutionize our concept of the universe. Mr. Galilei provided the city with a first-rate water pump, and the irrigation works he designed functioned splendidly. How was I to expect this? Not so fast, Priuli. I might be on the track of a very large gadget. Certain of the stars appear to have regular movements. If there were a clock in the sky, it could be seen from anywhere. That might be useful to your ship owners. I won't listen to you. I listened to you before. And as a reward for my friendship, you have made me the laughing stock of the town. <laughs> you can laugh. You got your money. But let me tell you this. You've destroyed my faith in a lot of things, Mr. Galilei. I'm disgusted with the world. That's all I have to say. He storms out. A businessman bored me. He suffers so. Did you see the frightened look in his eyes when he caught sight of a world not created solely for the purpose of doing business? Did you know that the telescopes had been made in Holland? I heard about it. <laughs> but the one I made for the senators was twice as good as any Dutchman's. Besides, I needed the money. How can I work with the tax collector on my doorstep? And my poor daughter will never acquire a husband unless she has a dowry. She's not too bright. And I like to buy books, all kinds of books. Why not? And what about my appetite? I don't think well unless I eat well. Can I help it if I get my best ideas over a good bottle of wine and a meal? They don't pay me as much as they pay the butcher's boy. If only I have, could have five years to do nothing but research. Come on. I'm going to show you something else. I don't know that I want to look again. This is one of the brighter nebula, the Milky Way. What do you see? It's made out of stars. Countless stars. Countless worlds. What about the theory that the Earth revolves around the sun? Have you run across anything about that? No. But I noticed something on Tuesday that might prove a step toward even that. Where's Jupiter? There are four lesser stars near Jupiter. I happened on them on Monday, but didn't take any particular note of their position. On Tuesday, I looked again. I could have sworn they had moved. They've changed again. Tell me what you see. I only see three. Where's the fourth? Let's go get to the charts, sit down, and work. They work through the night. It is near dawn. The only place the fourth can be is around the back of the larger star where we cannot see it. This means there are small stars revolving around the big star. Where are the crystal shells now that the stars are supposed to be fixed to? Jupiter can't be attached to anything. There are other stars revolving around it. There is no support in the heavens. Don't stand there looking at me. It's true. I suppose it is true. Why? I'm afraid. Why? What do you think is going to happen to you for saying that there is another sun around which other Earths revolve? And that there are only stars and no difference between Earth and Heaven? Where is God then? What do you mean? God. 
Where is God? Well, no, not there. Any more than he'd be here if creatures from the moon came down to look for then him. Then where is he? I'm a theolo I'm not a theologian. I'm a mathematician. You are a human being. Where is God in your system of the universe? Within ourselves. Or nowhere. Ten years ago, a man was burning the stake for saying that. Giordano Bruno was an idiot. He spoke too soon. He would never have been condemned if he could have backed up what he said with proof. Do you really believe that proof will make any difference? I believe in the human race. The only people that can't be reasoned with are dead. Human beings are intelligent. Intelligent or merely shrewd? I, I know they call a donkey a horse when they want to sell it, and a horse a donkey when they want to buy it. But is that the whole story? Aren't they susceptible to the truth as well? If anybody were to drop a stone and tell them that it didn't fall, do you think they would believe that? The evidence of your own eyes is a very seductive thing. Sooner or later, everybody must succumb to it. Galileo, I am helpless when you talk. A church bell has been ringing for some time, calling people to Mass. Mrs. Sardi enters, muffled up for Mass, carrying a candle protected from the wind by a globe. You promised to go to bed tonight, and it's five o'clock again. And why are you up at this hour? I'm going to Mass. How was the night? Bright. What did you find for the two? Only some small little specks on the side of a star. I must draw attention to them somehow. I think I'll name them after the Prince of Florence. <laughs> why not call them the Medicean planets? By the way, we may move to Florence. I've written to his highness, asking if he can use me as a court mathematician. Galileo! Now, my dear Segreto, I must have my leisure. My only worry is that his highness, after all, may not take me. I'm not accustomed to writing formal letters to great personages. Here, do you think this is the right sort of thing? Whose sole desire is to reside in your highness's presence, the rising son of our great age. Cosimo de' Medici is a boy of nine. The only way a man like me can land a good job is by crawling on his stomach. <laughs> I'm going to take my share of the pleasures of life in exchange for all my hard work. And about time, too. I have no patience, Segreto, for a man who doesn't use his brains to fill his belly. Then run along to mess now. Mrs. Sardi goes. Galileo, yeah, do not go to Florence. Why not? The monks are in power there. Going to Mass is a small price to pay for a full belly. And there are many famous scholars in Florence. Court monkeys! I shall enjoy taking them by the scruff of the neck and making them look through my telescope. Galileo, you are traveling the road to disaster. You are suspicious and skeptical in science, but in politics you are as naive as your daughter. How can people in power leave a man at large who tells the truth, even if it be the truth about the distant stars? Can you see the Pope scribbling a note in his diary? 10th of January, 1610. Heaven abolished. A moment ago, when you were at the telescope, I saw you tied to the stake. When you said you believed in proof, I smelt burning flesh. I am going to Florence. Galileo's house at Florence. Well appointed. Galileo is demonstrating his telescope to the philosopher, Prince Cosimo de' Medici, a boy of nine, accompanied by his Lord Chamberlain, later ladies and gentlemen of the court, and an assortment of university professors. With Galileo are Andrea and Federzoni, the new assistant. Mrs. Sardi stands by. Galileo's telescope is set in front of the gathered crowd. Truth is the daughter of time, not of authority. Gentlemen, the sum of our knowledge is pitiful. It has been my singular good fortune to find a new instrument which brings a small patch of the universe a little bit closer. It is at your disposal. Well, where is all this leading? Oh, uh, are we as scholars concerned with where the truth might lead us? Mr. Galilei, the truth might lead us anywhere. I can only beg you to look through my eyeglass. 
If I understand you correctly, you are asking, asking us to discard the teachings of 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, we've been looking at the sky and we didn't see the four moons of Jupiter. And there they were all the time. Why defend shaken teachings? You should be doing the shaking. My work is at the great arsenal of Venice brought me in daily contact with sailors, carpenters, and so on. These men are unread. They depend on the evidence of their senses, but they taught me many new ways of doing things. The question is whether these gentlemen here want to be found out as fools by the men who might not have the advantages of a, a classical education, but who aren't afraid to use their eyes. I tell you that our dockyards are stirring with the same high curiosity which was the true glory of ancient Greece. Wearing grandiose vestments does not give one the wisdom to approach the truth, but it does give one the authority to refuse it. So when Galileo asked the philosophers, professors, and people of the court to simply look through his telescope, their hesitancy to go against the prevailing faith translated into a fear of discovering truth. Even when Father Clavius, the greatest Catholic astronomer at the time, claimed Galileo's findings were correct, the elaborately dressed dignitaries turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the notion that the Earth revolved around the Sun. Upon Galileo's return to Rome, Cardinal Bellarmine invited him to a ball. To Galileo's surprise, it became an opportunity for the Holy Office to declare their decision that Galileo had to give up what they called a foolish, absurd, and heretical theory. Science is the beloved daughter of the Church, and she must have confidence in its authority. With Galileo feeling quite grim, Fulganzio, a little monk, comes to have a meaningful talk with him in the garden of the Florentine ambassador's home. Scene four. Galileo, feeling grim, a young monk came to visit him. The monk was born of common folk. It was in science that they spoke. The garden of the Florentine ambassador in Rome. Distant hum of a great city. Galileo and the little monk are talking. Well, let's hear it. The robes you are wearing gives you the right to say whatever you want to say. Let's hear it. I have studied physics, Mr. Galilei. That might help us if it enabled you to admit that two plus two is four. Mr. Galilei, I have spent four sleepless nights trying to reconcile the decree that I have read with the moons of Jupiter that I have seen. This morning I decided to come to you after I had said mass. You tell me that Jupiter has no moons? No. To, I found out that... I think the decree is a wise decree. It has shocked me into realizing that free research has its dangers. I have decided to give up astronomy. However, I felt the impulse to confide in you some of the motives which have impelled even a passionate physicist to abandon his work. Your motives are familiar to me. You mean, of course, the special powers invested in certain commissions of the Holy Office? But there is something else I would like to talk to you about. My family. I do not come from the great city. My parents are peasants in the Campania, who know about the cultivation of the olive tree and not much about anything else. Too often these days, when I am trying to concentrate on tracking down the moons of Jupiter, I see my parents. I see them sitting by the fire with my sister, eating their curded cheese. They scrape a living, and underlying their poverty is a sort of order. There are routines. The routine of scrubbing the floors, the routine of seasons in the olive orchard, the routine of paying taxes. The troubles that come to them are recurrent troubles. They draw the strength they need to carry their loaded baskets up the stony paths, to bear children, even to eat, from the sight of the trees greening each year anew, from the reproachful face of the soil, which is never satisfied, and from the church and the Bible texts they hear there on Sunday. They have been told that God relies upon them, and that the pageant of the world has been written around them, that they may be tested in the important or unimportant parts handed out to them. How could they take it were I to tell them that they were on a lump of stone, ceaselessly spitting in empty space, circling around a second-rate star? What, then, would be the use of their patience, their acceptance of misery? What comfort, then, the Holy Scriptures, which have mercifully explained their crucifixion? The Holy Scriptures would then be proved in mistakes. No, I see them begin to look frightened. I see them slowly put their spoons down on the table. They would feel cheated. There is no eye watching over us, after all, they would say. We have to stride out on our own, at our time of life. Nobody has planned a part for us beyond this wretched one on a worthless star. 
There's no meaning in our misery. Hunger is just not having eaten. It is no test of strength. Effort is just stooping and carrying. It is not a virtue. Can you understand that I read into the decree of the Holy Office a noble motherly pity and a great goodness of the soul? Oh, well, at least you have found out that it is not a question of the satellites of Jupiter, but the peasants of the Campania. And don't try to break me down by the halo of beauty that radiates from old age. How does, how does a pearl develop in an oyster? A jagged grain of sand makes its way into the oyster's shell, and it makes its life unbearable. The oyster then exudes slime to cover the grain of sand, and the slime eventually hardens into a pearl. The oyster nearly dies in the process. I say, to hell with the pearl. Let's have a healthy oyster. You know, virtues are not ex exclusive to misery. If your parents were prosperous and happy, they might develop the virtues of happiness and, and prosperity. Today, the virtues of exhaustion are caused by the exhausted land. For that, my new water pump could work more wonders than their ridiculous superhuman efforts. Be fruitful and multiply, for war will cut down the population, and our fields are barren. Shall I lie to your people? We must be silent from the highest of motives, the inward peace of less fortunate souls. My dear man, as a bonus for not meddling with your parents' peace, the authorities are tendering me on a silver power pa uh, platter, persecution-free, my share of the fat sweated from your parents, who, as you know, were made in God's image. Should I condone this degree, my motives might not be disinterested. Easy life, no persecution, and so on. Mr. Galilei, I am a priest. You are a physicist. How can new machinery be involved to domesticate the river water if we physicists are forbidden to study, discuss, and prove our findings about the greatest machinery of all, the machinery of heavenly bodies? Can I reconcile my findings on the paths of falling bodies with the current belief in the tracks of witches on broomsticks. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. You don't think that the truth, if it is the truth, would make its way without us? But no. No, no. As much of the truth gets through as we push through. You talk about the Campania peasants as if they were the moss on the huts. Naturally, if they don't get a move on and learn to think for themselves, the most efficient irrigation systems cannot help them. I can see their divine patience, but where is their divine fury? They are old! Galileo ah. stands for a moment, beaten. He cannot meet the little monk's eyes. He takes a manuscript from the table and throws it violently on the ground. What is that? Here is writ, what draws the ocean when it ebbs and flows. Let it lie. Thou shalt not read. Already? An apple off the tree of knowledge? He can't wait. He wolfs it down. He will rot in hell for all eternity. Look at him. Where are his manners? Sometimes I think I would let them imprison me in a place a thousand feet beneath the earth where no light could reach me. If in exchange I could find out what stuff that is, light. The bad thing is that when I find something, I have to boast about it, like a lover or a drunkard or a traitor. That is a hopeless voice that leads to the abyss. I wonder how long I shall be content talking to my dog. I don't understand the sentence. I'll explain it to you. I'll explain it to you. <clears throat> Galileo continued mounting a body of evidence that supported the Copernican theory and contradicted Aristotle and church doctrine. As well, he published his discourse on bodies and water, which refutes Aristotelian explanation. Cardinal Bellarmine 
continued to hold Galileo's research in check as he presented evidence on the sunspots, but Bellarmine's health gradually weakened due to his old age. After Bellarmine's death, Barberini, a great supporter of Galileo, is selected as the next pope. Scene 4.5. Eight long years with tongue in cheek, of what he knew he did not speak. Then temptation grew too great, and Galileo challenged fate. Galileo's house in Florence again. Galileo is supervising his assistants, Andrea and the little monk, who are about to prepare an experiment. Who ordered the earth stand still because their castles might be shaken loose if it revolves, and who only kissed the Pope's feet as long as he uses them to trample on the people. God made the physical world. God made the human brain. God will allow physics. They will try to stop us. Thus we enter the observation of these spots on the sun in which we are interested. At our own risk, not counting on the protection from a problematic new pope. But with great likelihood of dispelling Fabricius's vapors and the shadows of Paris and Prague, and of establishing the rotation of the sun. And with some likelihood of establishing the rotation of the sun. My intention is not to prove that I was right, but to find out whether I was right. Abandon hope, all ye who enter, an observation. Before assuming these phenomena are spots, which would suit us, let us first set about proving that they are not fried fish. We crawl by inches, but we find today we will wipe from the blackboard tomorrow and reject it, unless it shows up again the day after tomorrow. And if we find anything which would suit us, that thing we will eye with particular distrust. In fact, we will approach this observing of the sun with the implacable de the determination to prove that the earth stands still. And only if hopelessly defeated in this pious undertaking can we allow ourselves to wonder if we may not have been on the right track all the time. The earth revolves. Take the cloth off the telescope. Turn it on the sun. Quietly, they start work. Scene 5. A chamber in the Vatican. The Pope, Urban VIII, formerly Cardinal Barberini, is giving audience to the Cardinal Inquisitors. The trampling and shuffling of many feet is heard throughout the scene from the adjoining corridors. During the scene, the Pope is being robed for the conclave he is about to attend. At the beginning of the scene, he is plainly Barberini, but as the scene proceeds, he is more and more obscured by grandiose vestments. I see a little silhouette of a man Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Scaramouche and lightning, very, very frightening me Galileo, 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 say no No, no, no! Doctors from all chairs of the universities Representatives of the special orders of the church Representatives of the clergy as a whole who have come believing with childlike faith in the word of God as set forth in the scriptures, who have come to hear your holiness confirm their faith, and your holiness is really going to tell them that the Bible can no longer be regarded as the alphabet of truth. I will not set myself up against the multiplication tables. No! Ah, uh, that is what these people say, that it is the multiplication table. Their cry is, the figures compel us. But where do these figures come from? Plainly, they come from doubt. These men doubt everything. Can society stand on doubt and not on faith? Thou art my master, but I doubt whether it is for the best. This is my neighbor's house and my neighbor's wife, but why shouldn't they belong to me? After the plague, after the new war, after the unparalleled disaster of the Reformation, your dwindling flock looked to their shepherd, and now the mathematician is turning their tune to the sky and announcing to the world that you have not the best advice about the heaven. Either up to now, your only contested, uncontested sphere of influence. This Galilei started meddling in machines at an early age. Now that men in ships are venturing on the great oceans, I am not against that, of course. They are putting their faith in a brass bowl they call a compass and not an almighty God. This man is the greatest physicist of our time. He is the light of Italy, not just any muddlehead. We have had to arrest him otherwise. This bad man knows what he is doing. Not writing his books in Latin, but in the jargon of the marketplace. So 
was not in the best of taste. The shuffling feet are making me nervous. Maybe be more telling than my words, Your Holiness? Shall all these go from you with doubt in their hearts? This man has friends. What about Versailles? What about the Viennese court? They will call the Holy Church a cesspool of defunct ideas. Keep your hands off him! In practice, it will never get far. He is a man of the flesh. He can soften at once. He has more enjoyment in him than any man I ever saw. He loves eating and drinking and thinking. To excess, he indulges in thinking bouts. He cannot say no to an old wine or a new thought. I do not want to hear battle cries. Church, 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 reason, reason, reason! These shuffling feet are intolerable. Has the whole world come to my door? Not the whole world, your holiness. Uh, a select gathering of the faithful. It is clearly understood. He is not to be tortured. At the very most, he may be shown the instruments. That will be adequate, Your Holiness. Mr. Galilei understands machinery. The eyes of Barberini look helplessly at the Cardinal Inquisitors from under the completely assembled panoply of Pope Urban VIII. The Roman Catholic Church worried about the effect of accessible, adjustable science on society, and rightfully so. Scientists must always consider the morality behind their findings. For example, a petition to the President of the United States by 70 scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project claimed, We, the undersigned scientists, have been working in the field of atomic power. Until recently, we have had to fear that the United States might be attacked by atomic bombs during this war and that her only defense might lie in a counterattack by the same means. Today, with the defeat of Germany, this danger is averted, and we feel impelled to say what follows. The development of atomic power will provide the nations with new means of destruction. The atomic bombs at our disposal represent only the first step in this direction, and there is almost no limit to the destructive power which will become available in the course of their future development. Thus, a nation which sets the precedent of using these newly liberated forces of nature for purposes of destruction may have to bear the responsibility of opening the door to an era of devastation on an unimaginable scale. Scene 6. June 22nd, 1633. A momentous date for you and me. Of all the days, that was the one. An age of reason could have begun. Again, the garden of the Florentine ambassador at Rome, where Galileo's assistants wait the news of the trial. The little monk and Federzoni are attempting to concentrate on a game of chess. Mrs. Sardi kneels in a corner, praying and counting her beads. Thou Mary, full of grace, the Lord is The Pope the didn't even grant him an audience. Thousand. No more scientific discussions. The discourse he will never be finished. The Holy sum of his findings. Of they will kill him. Do you really think so? He will Amen. never recant. Blessed are thou amongst women. You know when you lie awake at night and have your mind fastens onto something Holy irrelevant? Mary, mother of God. Last night I could think of If they would only let him take his little stone God. with him. Amen. The appeal to reason pedal that he Mary, always carries in his heart. In the room they'll take him to, he won't Blessed have a thought. But, but he will not recant. How can they beat the truth out of a man who gave his sight in order to see? Maybe they can't. Amen. Hail Mary. Of grace. She is praying that he will recant. Blessed Leave her alone. Women, and she doesn't know whether she's on her head or on her heels since they got hold of her. Holy Mary, Mother of they God, brought her father and her from Florence. Now, our death. Mr. Galilei will be here soon. How many are they? Did they let him out? The Lord is Galilei is expected to recant at 5 o'clock. The big bell is St. Mark's will be rung, and the complete text of his recantation will publicly announced. I don't believe it. Now, Mr. Galilei will be brought to the garden gate at the back of the house to avoid the crowds flanking in the streets. Hail Mary, full of grace. The moon is an earth because the light of the moon is not her own. Jupiter is a fixed star, and four moons turn around Jupiter. Therefore, we are not shut in by crystal shells. The sun is the pivot of our world. Therefore, the earth is not the center. The earth moves, spinning about the sun. And he showed us. You can't make a man unsee what he has seen. Hail Mary. Five o'clock is in one minute. 
Blessed art thou, Mrs. Sardi, praise Lazarus. Blessed Lazarus. Is the fruit of thy Listen, all of you, they are murdering Holy the Mary, truth. Holy Mary, Mother of God, he pray for us. He slaps up his ears with his fingers. The two other pupils do the same. But Arzoni goes over to the little monk, and all of them stand absolutely still in cramped positions. Nothing happens. No bell sounds. After a silence filled with the murmur of Mrs. Sardi's prayers, Federzoni turns to the wall to look at the clock. He turns around. His expression changed. He shakes his head. They drop their hands. No. What is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus? No bell. It's three minutes after. He hasn't. He held God. true. It is all right. It is all no. right. And he did not no. recant. No. They embrace each other. They are delirious with joy. So force cannot accomplish everything. What has been seen can't be unseen. Man is constant in the face of death. June 22nd, 1633. Dawn of the Age of Reason. The Lord is with thee. I wouldn't have wanted to go on the again. You I didn't say anything, but I was in agony. Oh, ye of little faith. I was sure. It would have turned our morning to night. It would have been as if the mountain had turned to water. Oh, God, I thank thee. Beaten humanity can lift its head. A man has stood up and said no. They stand like statues. Mrs. Sardi stands up. The bell of St. Marcus. He's not damned. From the street, one hears the town crier. I know Leo Galilei, teacher of mathematics and physics. Do you hereby publicly renounce my teaching that the earth moves? I forswear this teaching with a sincere heart and an unfeigned faith, and detest and curse this and all other errors and heresies repugnant to the Holy Scriptures. Mrs. Sardi has gone, but the scholars are still there waiting. The mountain did turn to water. Galileo has entered quietly and unnoticed. He has changed, almost unrecognizable. He has heard Andrea. He waits some seconds by the door for somebody to greet him. Nobody does. They retreat from him. He goes slowly, and because of his bad sight, uncertainly, to the front of the stage where he finds a chair and sits down. I can't look at him. Tell him to go away. Steady. He saved his big gut. Give him a glass of water. The little monk fetches a glass of water for Andrea. Nobody acknowledges the presence of Galileo who sits silently on his chair, listening to the voice of the town crier, now in another street. I can walk. Just help me a bit. They help him to the door. Unhappy is the land that breeds no hero. No, Andrea. Unhappy is the land that needs a hero. After seeing the instruments of torture and being threatened by the church, Galileo was forced to recant his astronomical findings. After his recantation, the church put him under house arrest. He had an official with him at all hours of the day. He was allowed a pen and paper, however couldn't write himself, but could dictate to others what would be written down. The church had strict guidelines, for Galileo was an example to the rest of the scientific community within the Roman Catholic Empire. Scene 7. 1633 to 1642. Galileo remains a prisoner of the Inquisition until his death. A country house near Florence. A large room, simply furnished. There is a huge table, a leather chair, a globe of the world on a stand, and a narrow bed. A portion of the adjoining anteroom is visible and the front door which opens into it. In the large room, Galileo is quietly experimenting with a bent wooden rail and a small ball of wood. He is still vigorous, but almost blind. After a while, there is a knocking at the outside door. The official opens it to a peasant who brings a plucked goose. Mrs. Sardi comes from the kitchen. She is past 60. Somebody who is passing through sent you something. What is it? Can't you see it? A goose! Oh. Oh. Any name? No. Solid. Will you eat the liver? 
If I have it cooked with a little apple? I have my dinner. Are you under orders to finish me off with food? It's not rich. And what is wrong with your eyes again? <sighs> you should be able to see it. You were standing in the light. I was not. You haven't been writing again. What do you think? Mrs. Sardi takes the goose out into the anteroom and speaks to the official. You had better ask Monsignor Carpula to send the doctor. He couldn't see this goose across the room. Don't look at me like that. He has not been writing. He dictates everything to me, as you know. Yes? He abides by the rules. His repentance is sincere. I keep an eye on him. She hands the official the goose. Tell the cook to fry the liver with an apple and an onion. She goes back into the large room. And you have no business to be doing that with those eyes of yours. You may read me some horse. We should go on with your weekly letter to the Archbishop. Monsignor Carpula, to whom we owe so much, was all smiles the other day because the Archbishop had expressed his pleasure in your collaboration. Well, where were we? Paragraph four. Uh, read what you have. The position of the church in the matter of the unrest of Genoa. I agree with Cardinal Spilotti in the matter of the unrest among the Venetian rope makers. Uh, yes, yes. I agree with Cardinal Spilotti in the matter of the unrest among the Venetian rope makers. It is better to distribute good, nourishing food in the name of charity than to pay them more for their bell rope. It being surely better to strengthen their faith than to encourage their acquisitiveness. St. Paul says, charity never faileth. How is that? It's beautiful. It couldn't be taken as irony? No. no. The Archbishop will like it. It's so practical. I trust your judgment. Uh, read it over slowly. The position of the church in the matter of the unrest. Mrs. Sardi goes into the anteroom. The official opens the door. It is Andrea. Good evening. I am sorry to call so late. I am on my way to Holland. I was asked to look him up. Can I go in? I don't know whether he will see you. You never came. Ask him. Is that Andrea? Yes. I will send him away. I wish I'd show him in. Mrs. Sardi shows Andrea in. Mrs. Sardi sits. Andrea remains standing. Have you been keeping well, Mr. Galilee? Now sit down. What are you doing these days? What are you working on? I heard it was something about hydraulics in Milan. As he knew I was passing through, Fabricius of Amsterdam asked me to visit you and inquire about your health. I am very well. I am glad I can report you are in good health. The Fabricius will be glad to hear it. And you might inform him that on account of the depth of my repentance, I live in comparative comfort. Yes, we understand that the church is more than pleased with you. Your complete acceptance has had its effect. Not one paper expounding a new thesis has made its appearance in Italy since your submission. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are countries not under the wing of the church. Would you not say the erroneous condemned theories are still taught there? Things are almost at a standstill. Are they? Nothing from Descartes in Paris? Yes. On receiving the news of your recantation, he shelled his treaties on the nature of light. I sometimes worry about my assistants whom I led into error. Have they benefited by my exam? In order to work, I have to go to Holland. Yes. Federzoni is grinding lenses again back in some shop. He can't read the books. Fulgonzio, our little monk, has abandoned research and is resting in peace in the church. So, my superiors are looking forward to my spiritual recovery. I am progressing well, as can be expected. You are doing well. Uh, Mrs. Sardi, leave the room. Mrs. Sardi rises uncertainly and goes out. He was his pupil, so now he is his enemy. Help me in the kitchen. She leaves the anteroom with the official. May I go now, sir? 
I do not know why you came, Sarge. To unsettle me? I have to be prudent. I'll be on my way. As it is, I have relapses. I completed my discourse. You completed what? My discourse. How? I am allowed a pen and paper. My superiors are intelligent men. They know that the habits of a lifetime cannot be broken abruptly, but they protect me from my unpleasant consequences. They lock my pages away as I dictate them. And I should know better than to risk my comfort. I wrote the discourse out again during the night. The manuscript is in the globe. My vanity has up to now prevented me from destroying it. If you consider taking it, you will shoulder the entire risk. You will say that it was pirated from the original in the hands of the Holy Office. I, I have to employ my time somehow. Two new sciences. This will be the foundation stone of a new physics. Yes, yes, yes. Put it under your coat. And we thought you had deserted. Mr. Pellamy, how can I begin to express my shame? Mine has been the loudest voice against you. That would seem to have been proper. I, I taught you science, and I decried the truth. Did you? I think not. Everything has changed. What's changed? You shielded the truth from the oppressor. Now I see, in your dealings with the Inquisition, you use the same superb common sense you brought to physics. Oh. We lost our heads. With the crowd at the street corners, we said, he will die, he will never surrender. You came back. I surrendered, but I am alive. We cried, your hands are stained. You say, better stained than empty. The better stained than empty. Sounds realistic. Sounds like me. And I, of all people, should have known. I was 12 when you sold another man's telescope to the Venetian Senate and saw you put it to immortal use. Your friends were baffled when you bowed to the Prince of Florence. Science gained a wider audience. You always laughed at heroics. People who suffer bore me, you said. Misfortunes are due mainly to miscalculations. And if there are obstacles, the shortest line between two points may be the crooked line. It makes a picture. And when you stooped to recant in 1633, I should have understood that you were again about your business. My business being? Science. The study of the properties of motion, mother of the machines which will themselves change the ugly face of the earth. <laughs> You gained the time to write a book that only you could write. Had you burned at the stake in a blaze of glory, they would have won. They have won! There's no such thing as a scientific work that only one man can write. Then why did you recant? Tell me that. I recanted because I was afraid of physical pain. No. He showed me the instruments. It was not a plan? It was not. But you have contributed. Science has only one commandment. Contribution. And you have contributed more than any man for a hundred years. Have I? Then welcome to my gutter, dear colleague in science and brother in treason. I sold out. You're a buyer. The first sight of that book, his mouth watered, and his scoldings were drowned. Blessed be our bargaining, wake, whitewashing, and death-fearing community. The fear of death is human. Even the church will tell you that to be weak is not human. It is just evil. The church, yes, but science is not concerned with our weaknesses. No, my dear Andrea, in spite of my present convictions, I may be able to give you a few pointers as to the concerns of, of your chosen profession. Mrs. Sardi enters with a platter. In my spare time, I happen to have gone over this case. I have spare time. 
Even a man who sells wool, however good he is at buying wool cheap and selling it dear, must be concerned with the standing of the wool trade. The practice of science would seem to call for valor. She trades in knowledge, which is the product of doubt, and this new art of doubt has enchanted the public. They have learned to doubt. They snatched the telescopes out of their hands, and they had them trained on their tormentors. Prince, official, public moralist. The mechanism of the heavens was clearer. The mechanisms of the courts were still murky. The battle to measure the heavens is won by doubt. Word is passed down that this is of no concern to the scientist who is told he will only release such of his findings as do not disturb the peace that is, the peace of mind of the well-to-do. Threats and bribes fill the air. Can the scientists hold out on the numbers? For what reason do you labor? I take it that the intent of science is to ease human existence. As a scientist, I had an almost oh, unique opportunity. In my day, astronomy emerged into the marketplace. At that particular time, had one man put up a fight. It could have had wide repercussions. I have come to believe that I was never in real danger. And for some years I was as strong as the authorities. And I surrendered my knowledge to the powers that be to use it. No, to not use it, abuse it. As it suits their ends, I have betrayed my profession. Any man, any man who does what I have done must not be tolerated in the ranks of science. Mrs. Sardi, who has stood motionless, puts the platter on the table. You are accepted in the ranks of the faithful. Oh. Correct. I, uh, I have to eat now. We lock up at eight. I'm glad I came. Somebody who knows me, uh, sent a goose. I still enjoy eating. And your opinion now is now that the new age was an illusion? Well, this age of ours turns out to be a whore spattered with blood. Maybe new ages look like blood spattered whores. Well, take care of this. Yes. With reference to your evaluation of the author in question, I do not know the answer. But I cannot think that your savage analysis is the last word. Well, thank you, sir. Mrs. Sardi shows Andrea out. I don't like visitors from the past. They excite him. She lets him out. The official closes the iron door. Mrs. Sardi returns. Did you try to think who sent the goose? Not Andrea. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> I gave Redhead his first lesson. When he held out his hand, I had to remind myself he is teaching now. How is the sky tonight? Bright. Mm. End of play.